Hello and welcome to another edition of Medical Today. I'm Jared Rudnam. Very interesting subject matter we have for you in the next hour. But as always, we'll begin with the ageing and well-being. And to do that, uh, we have our usual suspect, Dr. Navendra Nagaswaran, Group Medical Director of Global Doctors. He's also joined by Dr. Gillian Yeo, the Managing Director of Grands Unlimited, which happens to be a daycare for seniors. Now, what are we talking about today? We're talking about the importance of strength training in ageing. Welcome to the show, Doc. Thank it's you. good to have you again, yep. Dr. Gillian. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much for Hi. taking time off your busy schedule to be with us today. Now, there's so much to be uh, answered with regards to strength training, yep? uh, but as we age, we now know that we need to start exercising. At what age does muscle mass and strength begin to decrease? Maybe you can start with this talk. Yeah, I think it starts from the age of 30. Every decade, we actually lose about 3 to 5% of our muscle mass. And as we grow older, and when we are 75, it actually hits the worst. Mm -hmm. And in 80 onwards, we become frail. So if we start doing strength training, like what you just said, that mm -hmm. will change things around. Right. Dr. Gillian, just let me... Uh, move on to you and talk about strength training for seniors. Now, how often should seniors do strength training? Well, actually for seniors or for any one of us, um, uh, both um, aerobic exercise and mm -hmm. also strength training are very important to our health. Uh, and according to the Center for Disease uh, Control, right, uh, it's recommended to do uh, two to three times of uh, strength training every week. And uh, for aerobic exercise, it's recommended for like uh, maybe three to five times in a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about uh, 30 to 60 minutes. Right, but, but doing exercises like these, you need someone to point you in the right direction. Uh, not really. If you are doing like aerobic exercise, uh, it could be like cardio exercise. You can do cycling. All right. Uh, this you do not need uh, someone to you know give you a guide right. or monitor. Right. You can actually do uh, running uh, exercises like um, even hiking. These are also considered as aerobic exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, but for strength training, and then of course uh, you need uh, someone uh, to recommend uh, the the right strength training for you. Like if uh, you're not uh, very sure as in what kind or how much of a strength you need or you can able to perform, then right. you definitely you need that advice. Right. Dr. Navin, you know, they yeah. say that when you build muscle, you're preparing for your older age, especially in your 40s. You know, mm -hmm. Whatever exercise you do, you need to be cognizant of the fact that uh, you know what muscles you're working on. Now, yeah. uh, I think before we get there, uh, the other question would be, can seniors build muscle? Is that a relevant question? Yes, seniors can definitely build muscle. Mm -hmm. It is basically, you shouldn't lose the muscle. The first thing is you shouldn't lose it. So we have to be active. We have to come out of a seat and start walking. You know, this Apple Watch with 10,000 steps mm -hmm. is actually good. You just have to keep walking. If you do the 10,000 step, so walking itself is already building up some strength training. Then you do some resistant training, as what Jillian said just now. You go to the gym or you work out in a place or you go cycling. That's all resistant. So well, basic strength is getting up, squatting, and there are so many other things that you can basically do at home itself without doing anything else. Like mm -hmm. what she just said, 150 minutes is recommended by the CDC a week. But generally, if you calculate the number of hours we actually sit in our chair and against what we're doing, that will give you the answer for strength training. Right. Now, with regards to strength training, I'm coming back to you, Dr. Gillian. Yeah. Let's talk about you using uh, exercise equipment. Now, yes. a lot of people can't go to a gym or they don't want to go to a gym. Mm -hmm. So you want to do it in the comfort of your home. Yes. Um, nowadays, we're looking at bands, exercise yes. bands. Resistant Is that band. uh, Resistant bands, yeah. Yes. Is that recommended for seniors? Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, for seniors, uh, for a start, they, sh they should actually uh, do body weight um, strength training or resistance training mm -hmm. using whatever body that, uh, the, the, the strength that they have in their body to start off with. And uh, once they become more comfortable with it, then they can increase the strength mm -hmm. or increase the resistance level, like uh, the band, uh, the exercise band and all that. Right. Uh, they can buy you know, a certain band that which, which has a, a, a better or more stronger uh, resistance towards it. Yeah, mm -hmm. This is what is recommended. Right. Yeah. Now, I think uh, the other thing we want to talk about today is sarcopenia. Can you just mm -hmm. give us a brief overview of what sarcopenia is? Sarcopenia is loss of muscle mass mm -hmm. and uh, at the same time your body muscles are weakening. So to strengthen them, one number one you have to eat well. 
that's the first thing we need to do. Higher protein, higher diet. So sarcopenia is preventable if you were to be active. Basically, active lifestyle is what's needed mm -hmm. for sarcopenia. Now, now, when you talk about an active lifestyle, there's another saying here. A lot of people say that, you know, once you're past your 50s or your 40s, you need to be careful of the exercises you do because your bones become brittle too every time you exercise. So I don't know if there's any truth to this. Maybe you can walk us through this, Dr. Jillian. Well, I would say uh, that is because uh, when, as we age, right, uh, we tend to have a lot of... Uh, um, uh, mobility issues like uh, you know it, it's kind of hurt uh, to our joint as well so most of the time all the trainings uh, regardless whether it's uh, strength training or resistance training mm -hmm. all you have to do is take care of the joint yeah I, I yeah. guess that's one of the downers you know when you try to do a squat or a lunge and yes. you know you feel joint pain mm -hmm. yeah but you know over and above that I think let, let's go back to what we're talking about sarcopenia now you know, mm -hmm. what are the classic symptoms of sarcopenia Basically, muscle weakness, mm -hmm. tired, fatigue, and becoming frail. See, as your muscles, you need your core muscles strengthened. If you don't have your core muscles strengthened, neuromuscularly, mm -hmm. the whole system will start to fail. It's like a car. If you just keep it stationary and you don't move it, the car, the next time you want to make it run, it won't move as fast as right. what you want it. The whole electri electrical system will fail. The human body is the same thing. So you have to become active to make it Good. Mm -hmm. So they say the the go-to standard or the mecca of core exercises would be, uh, let's say, uh, take for example, Pilates. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. are there Pilates? Pilates, for yoga. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. Pilates, yoga, yoga right. all of them. Tai Chi. Tai Chi, right. yeah. tai Chi is excellent mm -hmm. because it's got the resistance component and it's got the strength component because right. there's lots of resistance in Tai Chi mm -hmm. that actually builds up neuromuscular. So not only do you build up muscle mass that you're going to lose eventually, but you will also simultaneously build up neuromuscular strength, right. which well, is very hard to build. Of course, when you talk about exercises, I mean, off the top of my head, the first thing you can think about is your legs. Your legs need to be yeah. strong. Yes. But why do you say the core first? It's yeah. not yeah. just, um, well, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's just the core part because the core, uh, as we know, you know, um, for elderly, they tend to have a lot of uh, muscular skeletal uh, problem, mm -hmm. which is the back uh, problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and also that has uh, really got to do with uh, the core training, right. the core and the back extension. And of course, uh, not to forget is our um, lower limb, right. uh, the leg. So squat come into place and also the push up, uh, which is uh, target the upper body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all these yeah. components, right, uh, I would say it's very important. So you shouldn't just look at one part of it. Right. Yeah. So I wanted her to add on mm -hmm. that uh, for the core mm -hmm. is because, like, you know, we've been always talking about our gold standard here, a 94-year-old prime yes. minister. Mm. Of course. Horse riding. That was what I was keeping for. Horse mm -hmm. riding is something that you build up yeah. your core, right. so you you're straight. So you need to so that. It's already building resistance, and you're able to do that. So that actually does mm -hmm. help a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, okay. when you talk about sarcopenia, uh, are there treatments out there for sarcopenia? There are drugs. Mm -hmm. There are known as adenocorticotropics. Uh, right. There are also HRT. But you know HRT that women take, there are mm -hmm. a lot of side effects and the effects are not are detrimental to your whole well-being. Mm -hmm. But there are medications uh, for treating sarcopenia. In a worst case yeah, situation, yeah. 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 There, there are some that's being investigated too at this yes, point. Yes, correct. Yeah. Absolutely right. But I would still think the simplest treatment would be active exercise. exercise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. So that it, would is, be the is, best that, is that a cure? for muscle wasting. I guess that's the... There is a prevention. Mm -hmm. yes. There's a prevention, there's, there's no cure for it. There is a cure mm -hmm. which is reversible. You just have to do twice if you lead it towards damage of your muscles or loss of muscle. To build muscle back takes you longer time compared to losing it. So mm -hmm. if you prevent it, then you don't have to work double time. Right. So uh, when it comes to sarcopenia or anything which, which is related to muscle wastage, mm -hmm. uh, exercise can reverse this, yes. right? Yes, right. definitely. Right, so um, when we choose exercise, what do we need to think about, all of us, um, regardless well, of age? Yeah, regardless of age, I would say uh, when you're talking about the exercise, first of all, you need to set uh, yourself a goal. Mm -hmm. uh, what they're trying to achieve, mm -hmm. okay? But it then, should be exciting, also. Isn't it? Yes, mm -hmm. you have to make it exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, uh, so after that, uh, you have to look at your, uh, the plan. You have to start planning on uh, the exercises that you're going to do, whether it's two times in a week or three times in a week. Mm -hmm. Then after that, you should also, I mean, especially for the elderly, you should take into consideration of your balance. Right. Yeah, your balancing. Yeah, then um, the, the fourth one will be uh, coming back to, you know, your warming up exercise. How long are you going to uh, uh, design your warm-up sessions or your cool-down sessions? Mm -hmm. uh, that is actually more for those uh, who are not so used to uh, doing mm -hmm. exercise and they need some recovery time. Right. Yeah. So because for the first time after they, uh, they started their, their, their exercise, right? After mm -hmm. a long period of time, they have not gone into a gym or exercise routine. They might feel muscle soreness. Right. Yeah, so then you have to... And that's have only normal if you get muscle yes, soreness. Exactly. Yes. But there are also people who talk about using collagen. Now, is there any truth to this? There, there is yes and no again. Mm -hmm. But um, there are no proven studies to prove it. Mm -hmm. But collagen does help, like starting from your joints and all that. But there are a lot of side effects. The problem is you've got a lot of heartburn, reflux, mm -hmm. nausea, mm -hmm. digestive dysfunction. And as you grow old, the digestion system also tends to slow down. So we wouldn't want to encourage that. Mm -hmm. The simple day-to-day -day activity would be the best way to prevent and to also regain all the losing muscles due to age. Right. Dr. Jillian, I'm going to have, uh, have you have the last say. Well, give us five strength training tips for all the adults. Oh, We've got well, about 40 seconds left. Yeah, I would say first, uh, of course, is to know your objective. What is mm -hmm. the goal that you're trying to achieve? Yeah. So when you are uh, in your 60s, let's say, so you set a very realistic goal as in what you were trying to achieve uh, at your age, not uh, when you were in your 20s. Mm -hmm. Then uh, secondly would be uh, your plan, your, your strength training plan. Goal plan? Yes, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Then uh, third one is the warming up exercises, all right? right. And of course, uh, not to forget uh, to take care of the joint as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, recovery time. And <laughs> I'm going to uh, make it very time. short. So step, squat, lunge, walk, jog, hop and skip. And that was a tip by Dr. Navin and all our <laughs> friends at Global yeah. Doctors. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have you all here. And we do hope to have you in yes. the studio again at some point to yes. talk about exercising when I, sure. when, when I become a senior. Yeah. Thank, you Thank, you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much for staying with Thank us right you. here on Medical Today. We'll be back just after a short break. Stay with us. This is Medical Today on BNC. I have a vision correction number, but I'm more than a number. When I'm not enjoying my little sunshine, I'm enjoying my city's modern architecture. My Estelor lenses go beyond my correction. Their creasel technology shields my eyes from reflections, scratches and smudges for optimal clarity. I'm more than a number. I'm a crystal clear catcher of the perfect image. See more, do more. Estelor. Ask your eye care expert for advice. I have the vision correction number, but I'm more than a number. When I'm not sharing ideas with my colleagues, I'm defending my kingdom on the back of a dragon. My eyes and lenses go beyond my correction. They keep my eyes relaxed to stay focused and protect me from harmful blue light. I'm more than a number. I'm the never tired dragon eye, eyes and. Ask your eye care professional. See more, do more, Essilor. Hello and welcome back to Medical Today with me, Jared Rudnam. From what we spoke about just now, we now move into myopia control. Now, it simply means nearsightedness and is the most common cause of impaired vision in people under the age of 40. And in recent years, its prevalence is growing at an alarming rate. Now, joining me is Farah Azalia Mizan, an optometrist from OptoCare Group, to talk about myopia control. Farah, thank you very much for uh, being with us or for joining us. Now, uh, let's just start with a very basic question about myopia. What 
is myopia? Myopia is actually a term, scientific term for nearsightedness. Mm -hmm. It's a, a elongation of the eyeball, our own eyeball. We can't focus very well because due to the long eyeball of the shape of the eye compared to the normal eye. Mm -hmm. So the focusing of the vision is in front of the retina, which we're supposed to focus the vision on. Mm -hmm. So when it happens, we get blur vision, especially below, like you said, you know, below 40 years old of mm -hmm. age. Mm -hmm. And it's tremendously attacking all the youngsters nowadays at early childhood. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a chance to clear your throat while I talk about this <laughs> now. In recent years, uh, there's a prevalence uh, and uh, it's growing at an alarming rate. Correct. Now, why is this? Is this because of uh, the dawn of the internet age, social mm -hmm. media, mm -hmm. people are in front of the computer screens? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Like you said, now when we walk, walk, walk in into a house, like when we unplug the Wi-Fi, every like, oh, hello, what happened to Wi-Fi? Because the tablets and the uh, gadgets are all around us nowadays. Mm -hmm. So we can't actually say when is the good time for screening for kids because right. that thing is like just nearby them. So is it safe to say that we now have a myopia epidemic in the world? It's safe to say that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, because, so mm -hmm. well, what does it mean for optometrists? You know, does it mean more studying, more understanding of how we can stop myopia or slow it down? Mm. At the moment, there's no um, studies that we can prevent my peer from attacking mm -hmm. of onset. Don't buy computers for your children. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the prevalence is alarming because in 2010, it's only about uh, less than 50 population of the worldwide is myopic. Mm -hmm. But by 2050, I think the prevalence said it'll go more than 50% of the right. population, population right. is myopes. So, so if we want to simplify it a little bit more, uh, what are the risks of a myopic, a myopic eye? The risks, um, uh, when we have myopes, mm -hmm. the risk is actually if you have high refractive error, so later on in life you might get pathology like disease of the eyes. Okay, to even simplify it for those of us who don't understand mm -hmm. what is a refractive error, how would you? Refractive error, the one that you are using right now, yep. okay. um, is specs. You mm -hmm. correct your refractive error of the eye, right. which causes the myo. Right, so specs, uh, specs uh, essentially helps to correct the refractive error yes. of the eye. Right. The term is dioptic, the, the power of the, it's called dioptic power mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. refractive error. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like just now you said, um, there's textbook and studies, you can't prevent my fear from happening, but you can slow it down. Right, yeah. right. So now when you talk about myopia, what is myopia control? What does it actually mean when we say we, our topic is myopia mm -hmm. control? So what, what does it actually mean? Myopia control mm -hmm. is at the moment in worldwide, is a program or treatment mm -hmm to slow down and the progression of the myopia actually. Right. It's not to prevent from it happening, but to slow it down, mm -hmm. especially at childhood age. As like all automatic advice, as our practice in osteo care, we also advise children to drop by to any optometry practice to get their eye tested mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. early as three years old onwards to see whether they have symptoms of myopia or not and we can start from right. there. So with regards to treatment or fixing this, what options do we have uh, in Malaysia mm -hmm. and also outside, outside of our country? In Malaysia, is the famous con uh, options in Malaysia at the moment is of course spectacle correction, special lens, mm -hmm. special lens correction which is multifocal lens mm -hmm. and multifocal contact lenses to correct the MIPA control. And the recently one in Malaysia is, it's not quite recent actually, but a few years back already, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. most of the automatrics has been practicing it. Right. It's called autokeratology, mm -hmm. which you sleep with contact lenses. I'm not even going to try <laughs> to pronounce that again. Okay? <laughs> autokeratology means, the short form is mm -hmm. auto K. Auto K. Auto K. Yeah, okay. If mm -hmm. you heard auto K, it means at night you sleep with the lens 
and then daytime you're free of spectacles or contact lenses mm -hmm. so you can do most of the activities right if you take take a look at the uh, different age ranges mm -hmm. uh, what's the age range at which it's still possible to control the uh, progression of myopia yeah. and mm -hmm. what's the most effective way for controlling it at this point talking about age uh, as in my practice we start correcting the patients that are about 7 to 13 years old already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can walk into a, any optometrist clinic and ask for this program so mm -hmm. that they will monitor the children from age 7 until they are teenagers. Right, and uh, the most effective way of controlling it? The most effective way at the moment, we can't actually, that's the most effective way because right. there's a So tool. it's different with yeah, different individuals, different. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, we have to do eye tests first and then but the common one is multifocals, uh, contact lens and spectacles, mm -hmm. which is very useful for the children to adapt. And auto, auto is since auto case new, and you can ask the option at right. the optometrist. Right. I don't know practice. if this is the right question to ask, but you know, when you look at it, um, people always say with degeneration of something, mm -hmm. people are always asked if you can reverse it. Mm. Now, is there a possibility of reversing this? Oh, well, you're smiling, it's bad news for us. <laughs> so, unfortunately, if you don't have parents with myopic or you don't have a quiet myop, myopic uh, reflective error, there's no chance of reversing the myopia, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, okay. But we can slow down the progression. We, mm -hmm, we can slow down the progression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so when, when we slow down the progression, there are also other things that can be done. A lot mm -hmm. of people talk about foods that are good for mm -hmm. eye health. Right. You know, they've got, I've been to, uh, what do you call that, the uh, pharmacy, mm -hmm. and I see a lot of supplements for eye health now. Well, you uh, can so, still, yeah, mm -hmm. what, what is your advice or your tip with regards to this? For um, talking about remedies, mm -hmm. you can still advise children, especially youngsters, to get their vitamins, veggies, broccoli, all mm -hmm. that, and carrots at your childhood right. age to prevent all those diseases later on. But once my repair occurred, mm -hmm. you have to slow it down by taking all this, by us using all this treatment. Right. So you, mm. you need to eat your vegetables. And with carrots being one of them, okay? <laughs> you know, they always say carrots are good for your eyes, yeah. you never knew why. The vitamin D and, <coughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and for youngsters, since they like gadgets so much nowadays, right? So we advise them at least minimum two hours mm -hmm. outdoor activity, right. at least, so that they can refocus their strength of the eyes right. rather than so outdoor activity is in, very good in in the sun, mm. of course. Yeah, of yes. course. You know, just tell your mm. children go out there. Sun. Play. There's there's something called a sun outside. <laughs> there's sunblock. Uh, you can use sunblock yeah, yeah, if you yeah, worry yeah, so yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this is very important. Mm -hmm. Going out and playing in the sun and uh, upping your uh, levels of vitamin yes, D. Yes. Yeah? Li limit now, the gadgets times indoor and. How is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even and I mean, my children. You, you have children. Yeah. Uh, do you mm. find it possible to limit gadget time? <laughs> so uh. we have to be a very firm parents. Then. Yeah. yeah. But what, what you can do while they're using the tabs, you have to monitor the length of the position of the tabs and mm -hmm. the gadgets, not too close in front of their eyesight, mm -hmm. at least the arm length. Right. So like that. So. Or, and then the lighting has to be very fully equipped, not in dark room or on the bed without any room lights, because mm -hmm. it's really harmful actually. So in short, no gadgets in the room, <laughs> in the dark. <laughs> if you can do that. Yeah. Well, uh, let, let's take a look at one more question for mm -hmm. you. What's the long-term risk for high myopes, for those of us with, with, with high power, mm -hmm. so to speak? Is it true that these risks are not mitigated even though uh, if they go through LASIK or other corrective work? The long-term myopes, if they have high reflective error in, later in life, mm -hmm. they might have ocular disease like retinal detachment, mm -hmm. means our focusing area of the eye get torn. Right. So because of the stretch of the eyeball, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. length of the eyeball is stretched, that's most of the common symptoms right. later right. on, if you don't prevent it. That's so why we have to really advise children to go for as early as possible eye tests mm -hmm. at any optometrist practice. Right. Mm -hmm. But before I let you go, Farah, mm -hmm. what's your one tip you want to tell all of us with regards to myopia control? Or that piece of advice you have for us before we close? 
Uh, so the topic today is about my weapon control mm -hmm. and usually it's related to children because late or adult already got myopia. We can't reverse that or we can't even slow it down when we are adults. So please bring your children to any optometric practice and get a proper comprehensive eye exam. And you can ask about MIFAC control to the optometrist right. themselves. Right. Yeah. Farah, thank you very much. We just spoke to Farah Azalia Mizan from OptoCare Group. She's an optometrist or a trained optometrist to be exacting, joining us talking about myopia control right here on Medical Today. We'll take a short break and come back just after a break. Stay with us. I have a vision correction number, but I'm more than a number. When I'm not teaching courses, I'm taking steeper grades and tight corners. My SLR lenses go beyond my correction. They make my vision as sharp as my reflexes to capture every detail from near to far at any speed. I'm more than a number. I'm a rapidly focusing champion of courses. See more, do more. SLR. Ask your eye care expert for advice. a vision correction number, but I'm more than a number. When I'm not enjoying my little sunshine, I'm enjoying my city's modern architecture. My Essilor lenses go beyond my correction. Their creasel technology shields my eyes from reflections, scratches and smudges for optimal clarity. I'm more than a number. I'm a crystal clear catcher of the perfect image. See more, do more. Essilor. Ask your eye care expert for advice. Hello and welcome back to Medical Today with me, Jared Ratnam. Uh, we have a very interesting segment for you right now, talking about heart attacks. Now, warning signs of a heart attack. Are you at risk? This is always a question we need to ask ourselves. Now, our host, uh, Nurata Amin, spoke to two uh, very interesting people from uh, the Regency Specialist Hospital. She spoke to Dr. Paul Linka Hing. He's the resident consultant cardiologist. She also did speak to Fung Mok Yan, who's a dietitian from the Regency Specialist Hospital. Let's take a look at this video. <laughs> Heart attack or myocardial infarction is a life-threatening condition that could occur to anyone at any time due to existing conditions known or unknown. Heart attacks may be presented by a variety of symptoms, the most common being chest pain, shortness of breath and tingling in arms, shoulder or jaw. Identifying the symptoms early can save a life. Let's find out more and also the treatments, preventive measures and contributing factors that lead to heart attack. Dr. Paul, Hi. it's good to have you with us on Medical Today. You're welcome. So, what is myocardial infarction or as we call it, heart attack? Okay. Myocardial infarction is a serious medical condition. It actually happens when there's an acute blockage of one of the blood vessels that is supplying the heart muscle. It occurs and is actually a life-threatening event. Because of the blockage of the artery, damage will set in into the heart muscle. And the heart muscle will become irregular and suddenly the patient can develop what we call a cardiac arrest in which the heart stops on its own. So it's actually one of the conditions that is the very commonest cause of cardiac death in the young and in the older population. So, does that cover the types of heart attacks? There are multiple types of heart attack that we are aware of. A heart attack basically just means damage to the heart muscle because of an interruption in blood supply. The one that we are most concerned about is what we call an ST segment myocardial infarction. This occurs suddenly, acutely, commonly in the 40s and the 50s, where there's actually a blockage of the artery 
because of a blood clot inside. This right. is a condition that is mm -hmm. life-threatening. People have to be aware that they have this condition when they have the chest pain and to seek urgent treatment as soon as possible. Otherwise, the mortality and the prognosis for a heart attack is very poor. It's estimated about 30% of people who have what we call an ST elevation myocardial infarction never make it into hospital. They actually die at home because of a cardiac arrest. So it is also very important that we are aware of it. And nowadays, a lot of people in the public knows a little bit about what we call cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR. This is basically a procedure that can be learned in which we will try to actively restart the heart by pumping the chest to provide blood flow to the rest of the body and to the brain when the heart is stopped while we are waiting for urgent medical treatment. Right, so in your opinion, um, what is the contributing factor to developing heart disease? There are multiple risk factors for developing heart disease. Mm -hmm. High blood pressure, diabetes, overweight, elevated cholesterol level, these are all what we call risk factors. One of the risk factors that is actually the most serious cause of a sudden acute heart attack in the younger population is actually smoking. Smoking is prevalent in Malaysia. About 40% of Malaysians actually smokes and it's actually one of the countries where smoking is actually more frequent in the young. In other parts of the world, smoking is actually reducing, but in Malaysia, it's still increasing. Smoking actually harms the blood artery to the heart because it causes the blockage of the heart to become unstable in which there will be a blood clot that acutes, happens suddenly and blocks the blood flow to the heart artery causing a heart attack. So of all the risk factors that we are, have in causing a heart disease, smoking is actually the one that we can actually prevent because this is something that we, from our willpower, should be able to stop the rest of the risk factors like your genetic risk factors, your, your descendants, your race, these are certain things that we really cannot control. If we are born in a family where there's a very bad history of a heart problem, there's something that we really cannot alter. But smoking is something that we should be able to change. Right. How about cholesterol, doctor? What is the safe level to maintain your cholesterol? Okay. Elevated cholesterol has been associated with heart disease and it's been proven in many clinical trials that elevated cholesterol is a predisposing for developing heart disease. Now, in terms of how high your cholesterol is, it depends on a few factors. One of it, obviously, is food intake, which is very, very important in maintaining what we call a good cholesterol and reducing your bad cholesterol. The other thing that we really have to be concerned about in cholesterol is that certain parts of high cholesterol is due to what we call genetic factor. We are actually born with our genetic makeup that we cannot clear the cholesterol from our body, hence increasing in elevated cholesterol level. So people who have heart disease should be taking medication to lower their cholesterol as much as possible. Even if people with heart disease have a little bit of elevated cholesterol, they should already be on treatment to lower it because cholesterol is a high predisposing factor for developing heart attack and complications of heart attack. In terms of the absolute level, it depends on your risk. If you have a high risk, then your cholesterol level should be lower than a person who has low risk. But the most important thing about cholesterol is awareness. If you have a family history or someone who has a high cholesterol heart disease, please get your cholesterol level checked. Right. So doctor, could you kindly explain how would a doctor treat this disease according to its severity? Okay. Now it depends on the presentation. Mm -hmm. If the patient comes in with a heart attack, we have to go and do something urgently. We have to do a condition, a procedure in what we call coronary angioplasty or stenting. It has to be done to prevent complications to the patient. This is the first thing that we do if patient comes in to us with a heart attack. The sooner do we do it, the better the prognosis is for the patient. For certain other conditions where it's not so acute, where it's not a heart attack but the beginning of heart disease, we have to do what we call an angiogram to see what the condition of the artery is. All right, coronary angioplasty and stenting. So besides that, how does it work compared to other alternatives such as coronary artery bypass surgery? 
In coronary angioplasty and stenting, mm. is actually a mini va minimally va invasive procedure. Okay, in the procedure, what we actually do is we make a small cut or incision in the hand of the patient or in the groin of the patient in which we thread a very long catheter up all the way to the heart and we find out where the blockage of the heart artery is. Once we identify where the blockage is and what is causing the problem in the heart attack, we thread a very small wire and a balloon across the blockage and we open up the blockage with the balloon. After the blockage has been opened up with a balloon, we actually put in a stent. A stent is basically a metallic spring. And we insert or put the stent in where the area is blocked in to prevent re-blockage of the area. Right. It's actually a minimally invasive the procedure. The patient doesn't need to have any general anesthesia. It is normally completed to one to two hours. Patients love having this procedure done compared to other alternatives. In other alternatives, in patients who have very severe blockage, including all the three arteries or in multiple blockages, and if they have diabetes, then sometimes they have to go for another more invasive procedure called a coronary artery bypass surgery. In this procedure, is actually an invasive procedure requiring at least a week stay in the hospital and in ICU, where a blood vessel is actually taken from the leg and from the chest and is what we call grafted into the blockage to prevent, to basically bypass across the occlusion to provide blood flow to the vessel. So coronary angioplasty and stenting is now the routine preferred first line treatment for a heart attack because it's non-invasive, it's actually less fuzzy and it actually provides very good data and prognosis to the patient. All right. So. Now we want to focus on time, of course. Mm. As you said, you have to treat it as soon as possible. Mm. So time is an essential factor in treating a heart attack. So how much time does a person have um, to survive the attack before it is fatal? Okay. Now the first thing to know about timing is the heart, mus the heart is basically a muscle. Mm. The sooner the treated, the better. The longer we leave it, the heart muscle will die during a heart attack. Okay. So the first thing that your patient has to be aware is they have to recognize that this is a heart attack. Now, not just pain, in some people they get profuse sweating, they faint, and this could also be signs of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is that they'll be aware that this is a heart attack and seek urgent treatment. I have told you already that nearly 30% of people with a heart attack die at home, they never make it into hospital because of what we call a cardiac arrest. Of those that make it into hospital, 10% still die in the hospital despite best medical treatment. So time is of essence in getting the patient into the hospital. Once the patient is in our emergency department, in our emergency room, then we will do what we call an electrocardiogram, which is the ECG reading of the heart. If this confirms a heart attack, then we have to get the cardiologist to come in to do the coronary angioplasty and ballooning treatment. This is potentially live treatment. So most hospitals will have a guideline in terms of how fast we should proceed to treat this patient. So most international guidelines say that from the time that the patient comes into our emergency department to the time that they get treatment, it should be not more than 60 minutes if possible. The, not, the faster, the better it is for the patient. So I think any prevention of, especially for this disease, should start at a tender age. So what would you think the best way to educate our young ones? Okay, I think obviously uh, the best way to educate the young one is basically a promotion of a healthy lifestyle, a reduction in sedentary activities. We are now launched with epidemics of handphones, smartphones, computer, uh, myself included, my children included, and I'll have uh, addiction to handphone nowadays. I think that is a, is a very bad epidemic that is going on. Sedentary lifestyle leads to obesity. Okay? And obesity is a great predisposing factor to not just a heart problem, but to a whole host of other problems yeah. like early diabetes, True. high blood pressure. Okay? In the past, we know that diabetes people normally get it in the 40s, 50s, but now I'm seeing children in the 10s, in the 20s who are starting to develop diabetes because of this sedentary lifestyle problem and this weight problem. 
So I think active promotion of healthy activities, family bonding activities of a physical education, exercising, jogging, these are something that we really have to inculcate in our young population. The government is imposing sugar tax uh, for soft drinks. You know, I think that is also a very, very good example of cutting down dependence on sugar and to prevent uh, complications of diabetes and high blood pressure and obesity in the young population. So what measure would you take as an individual or of course as a professional doctor mm. to create awareness for prevention for this disease? Okay. As a professional doctor, I think you know, we have to depend not just on individual effort, we also have to depend on a collective effort. As an individual, I think most doctors, if they have the knowledge, please pass the knowledge to the younger generation. I also teach in a medical school. You know, I think inculcate you know, your teachings, explaining to your fellow colleagues the importance of risk factors in prevention of heart disease, giving talks to them, uh, giving talks to uh, parent teachers associations, schools. These are a way of passing your knowledge uh, and also you know, an uh, example to the younger population. Collectively, as a group of doctors, together with our medical association, I think we should be also be lobbying the government in terms of uh, prevention of heart disease. I think sugar tax is something that is good for the general population. There are talks about cutting down, uh, opening hours for mama shop, which I think is an excellent idea in terms of reducing uh, problems of obesity and consumption of food, especially in the, in the late evenings. So I think this is something that the medical association and the doctors as a collective should also be lobbying the government on. So doctor, mind sharing with us the challenges uh, that you face with your patient or your, the challenges that your patients have gone through, okay. through treatments right. before, during and post? Okay. A lot of patients eventually will have what we call atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is basically hardening of the body blood vessel because of age, because of diabetes, because of high cholesterol. The patients have to be aware that this is a progressive condition. It will never be cured. What I am seeing as a cardiologist is actually a patient who already had this heart problem, who comes in with a heart attack. So what I am actually doing is to prolong their life, treat them as best as I can when they're having a heart attack. Unfortunately, as human beings go, a lot of the time, once the patient is well after a heart attack or had the angioplasty done and they went home, they forgot that this atherosclerosis is a lifelong condition. Some of them forgot to take the medication. Some of them go back to smoking. In fact, I would say majority of them go back to smoking. Some of them will go back to their old stressful lifestyle, you know, with no consideration of dietary restriction. So every time when I follow up this patient, it actually saddens me to hear that they've actually gone back smoking, they've actually gone back to their unhealthy lifestyle. I really had to keep emphasizing that this is actually, unfortunately, a lifelong condition. There's no cure for it. What we are actually doing is to treat it as best as we can. Right. Thank you, Dr. Paul, for the good inputs that you have shared with us on Medical Today. With heart disease or high cholesterol, the dietitian will do a comprehensive nutritional assessment including a diet recall with the patients. Based on the diet recall and the patient's culture, we will give them a proper nutrition interventions by educating them how to identify the types and amounts of the oil they can consume, understand the food nutrition label and also provide them some tips to do some lifestyle modification. They have two types of fats, good fat and bad fat. Good fat is unsaturated fats such as omega-3, 6 and 9. It can be found in those deep sea fish like salmon, tuna, sardine and some plant-based food like avocado, nuts and vegetables oil. For the bad fats, it is considered as saturated fat and trans fat. 
These two types of fat can be found in those red meat and coconut oil, palm oil, palm kernel oil and butter. These two types of fat will increase our bad cholesterol which is called LDL cholesterol and reduce the good cholesterol which is HDL cholesterol. Nowadays, many people were concerned about the margarine and butter. In the market, they have two types of margarine, soft margarine and hard margarine. For the soft margarine, it's mixed by those vegetable oil such as sunflower oil and olive oil. It contains high amount of unsaturated fat. Well, for the hard margarine, it is contains high amount of the trans fat and saturated fat. Well, for the butter, when we look at the nutrition fat, it also contains high amount of the saturated fat and some amount of the trans fat. That's why, as a dietitian, we are not recommend them to take the hard margarine and also the butter. According to the American Heart Association, there are four lifestyle changes which help us to reduce the risk of getting heart disease. First, follow the heart-healthy diet, which means that we lower down the saturated fat and trans fat intake. At the same time, increase the dietary fiber intake from the fruits, vegetables and whole grain. And also, we have to be careful about the salt intake. Second, be physically active. We recommend the patient to do at least 150 minutes of exercise per week, such as jogging, brisk walking, swimming, and attend some fitness classes. Third, to be, conscious, uh, to be concerned about your body weight, by losing about 10% of your current body weight will help us to reduce the risk of getting heart disease. The last one is to stop smoking and drinking. As we know, smoking and drinking will increase your risk of getting heart disease. That was our very lovely Nurata Amin speaking to Dr. Paul Ling, a resident consultant cardiologist from Regency Special Hospital, and also Ms. Fong Mok Yan, a dietitian from the Regency Specialist Hospital, talking about warning signs of a heart attack. And the question is, are you at risk? Please go check with your primary healthcare specialist if you have any signs. Well, uh, stay with us. We'll take a short break and come back with our final segment right here on Medical Today. I have the vision correction number, but I'm more than a number. When I'm not sharing ideas with my colleagues, I'm defending my kingdom on the back of a dragon. My eyes and lenses go beyond my correction. They keep my eyes relaxed to stay focused and protect me from harmful blue light. I'm more than a number. I'm the never tired dragon eye. Eyes in. Ask your eye care professional. See more. Do more. Essie Law. A vision correction number but I'm more than a number when I'm not teaching courses I'm taking steeper grades and tight corners my SLR lenses go beyond my correction they make my vision as sharp as my reflexes to capture every detail from near to far at any speed I'm more than a number I'm a rapidly focusing champion of courses see more do more SLR ask your eye care expert for advice Hey there, this is Medical Today. I'm Jared Rutnam. In our final segment of Medical Today, or episode 5 to be exacting, we're going to take a look at another video. Every week we bring you a video in our Accidents and Incidents segment. Today we're taking a look at a video talking about wound dressing by Makota Medical Center. So it's a very, very interesting video. Let's take a look and see what insights we can uh, take back from this video.
This is a demonstration on wound dressing. Here is the step-by-step -step instruction. Number 1. Prepare the standard dressing items which are sterile gloves, apron, mask, non-sterile gloves, dressing set. Ensure patient is in a comfortable sitting position. Wear apron, mask and latex gloves to remove patient's wound dressing. Perform hand hygiene. Open the outer layer of dressing set. Perform hand hygiene again. Wear sterile gloves. Perform dressing. Use correct aseptic technique while doing the dressing. Clean the wound from clean to dirty area without touching other areas. Discard all used dressing items, then remove gloves and mask. After removing gloves, Discard all used dressing items and masks. Lastly, perform hand hygiene as it is the single most effective action to reduce infection. Another very interesting video there uh, for you right here on Medical Today that was something about wound dressing by Makota Medical Center. We hope to bring you more videos of that nature right here on Medical Today. Now, if you do ha have any questions for us, please do send us an email. Send it to ask at medicaltoday.my. That's ask at medicaltoday.my. And we'll get doctors and subject matter experts to reply to your questions right here on the show. Next week on the show, we'll be talking about prostate cancer or diseases of the genitourinary system, a big word for us to delve into. I will be having Dr. Thanabalan V. Sivaratnam, a resident consultant urologist from Makota Medical Center, joining us right here on Medical Day. On that note, I'm Jared Ratnam signing off. We certainly do hope you had a fantastic time right here with us today on Medical Today, Episode 5. Jared Ratnam signing off. Have a great day ahead.